speakers today. Uh, there we go. Great. Uh, three speakers today. Uh, first one is on uh, Karen Prey from Clark University, and she's going to talk about the satellite-based uh, aspects of sea ice cover, sea surface temperature, and productivity as part of the DVO. The second will be uh, Maria Kavanaugh from Oregon State. She'll talk about seascapes and spatial patterns in, in the Arctic ecosystem. And then Lynette Boisvet from, the, uh, from NASA Cryosphere Science will speak about the website and updates. So what I want is we'll have the presentations and maybe take uh, one question or so, and then we'll have the three of them as a short little panel for 10 minutes after, after the three presentations. So with that, um, unless there's any questions, I'm gonna have uh, invite Karen to, oh, I should say uh, there, Kathy Kuhn is on here. She's the co-chair of the Marine Ecosystem Collaborative Team. I think Danielle's on vacation. Okay, <laughs> Karen, you're up. Thank you so much, Jackie. And it's really nice to see you all. I appreciate you coming today. Um, <clears throat> so my uh, sort of intention here um, is to really just kind of give a, a basic broad brush stroke kind of survey of the type of the type of satellite products that we can utilize to look at the DBO site. Um, and kind of looking at the names across the, the, the board in attendance today, it seems like we sort of have a lot of people who are very well versed in DBO, so I won't go into great detail today, but um, obviously we, we have these sites, um, you know, across the region, DBO one through eight. Um, I'm also plotting here the mean sea ice edges in um, March in the south and in September in the north. And of course, as you all know, we had some really unique um, sea ice characteristics um, conditions in 2018 and 2019. Um, 2020, as you can sort of see, the, the March um, sea ice edge um, sort of was, was back farther towards normal. Um, but just to kind of get a, a lay of the, the land um, across the um, across these sites, um, <laughs> throwing throwing some some really quick images up here. On the left are um, mean sea ice concentrations um, by month. On the right are mean sea surface temperatures. On the right, and I'm not going to go into great detail here, other than just to mention, of course, we know there's incredible seasonality across the region. Um, uh, with physical characteristics, but of course biological ones as well that we can me measure by satellite. Um, but really kind of a unique opportunity to, to look at the satellite products across a latitudinal gradient um, that experiences some pretty extreme seasonality in these drivers as well. Um, so sea ice obviously is, is one thing that, that we look at. There are also kind of ancillary subsidiary products that can be developed from sea ice concentrations as well. So I'm showing just some basic ideas of that here. Um, in the first plot here, this is just the mean annual sea ice persistence um, over the 2003 to 2020 um, time period. Um, we can also utilize basically the presence or absence of sea ice denoted by the 15% sea ice concentration, the timing of that occurrence to determine the spatial distribution of the mean timing of sea ice breakup, the mean timing of sea ice formation. And of course, this phenological approach really kind of gives some uh, additional insights um, into the biological ramifications of sea ice um, variability as well across the region. Um, in terms of all eight of these DBO sites, as I said, um, we've got a really kind of nice array showing um, uh, latitudinal variability from um, south to north. In sea ice concentrations, um, we can get a sense of the seasonality of surface nitrate concentrations as well, um, sea ice concentrations, which we already talked about. Um, and then we can start to plot an idea of when does sea ice breakup typically happen? When does sea ice formation typically happen? Um, the number of days of sort of average open water at each of these sites can be um, uh, designated as well. And in the green um, bars, that's actually denoting the mean annual primary productivity measured by satellite at each one of these sites as well. So at least by satellite, we can see that there's pretty significant productivity at DBO2 and DBO3. Um, of course, very, very significant seasonality as well, but just to kind of get a sense of, of how things vary from, from south to north. Um, mean chlorophyll concentrations um, at many of the sites, we see that subsidiary um, fall bloom that, that oftentimes gets talked about in terms of that becoming more pronounced with, um, with uh, the lengthening of the open water season into the fall. 
Um, and of course, an idea of what primary productivity looks like across um, the months as well. Um, <clears throat> So we can look at sort of those extracted variables. We can also start to look at trends in spatial variability as well. So over that time period that I'm defining from 2003 to 2020, we can sort of stack up all of our sort of annual sea ice persistence data in terms of, of having a sense of how many days per decade we're actually losing in terms of sea ice cover and how those are distributed uh, among the eight DBO sites. Um, we can also do the same in terms of stacking up all of those maps of sea ice breakup and seeing um, where those trends are greatest. Um, sea ice formation, the same thing. The hatch patterns are, are designating those pixels that are statistically significant using a man candle test for trend. So that's essentially what, um, what we're showing there. Um, but lots of sort of spatial heterogeneity in terms of the timing of sea ice breakup. Um, the timing of sea ice formation tends to be a little bit more of a synoptic process, and so the trends tend to be a little bit um, clearer on, on, on that side of the um, open water season. And then lastly, just to kind of get a sense of, of what the trends in primary productivity have done over that same time period as well, if we look at the amount of primary productivity um, that is modeled using all sorts of input variables, including um, satellite data um, uh, indicating chlorophyll concentrations, we get a sense of how things have changed across the region, again, as they relate to the individual DBO sites. Um, <clears throat> we can also kind of look at individual months to kind of get a sense of how things have changed in terms of, of chlorophyll concentrations measured by satellites and primary productivity is it measured by satellites on a monthly basis as well. Um, and we tend to find in the earlier sort of spring seasons, we get a lot of sort of spatial heterogeneity, a lot of really strong trends um, in terms of, of the overall change per decade, as, you're, as I'm denoting here per month. Um, then as we sort of get into the, the later months um, in terms of July, August, September, um, those trends start to be a little bit broader, um, a little bit less spotty, um, not quite as strong as the early months, but, but um, overall sort of um, uh, spatially more consistent. Um, we can summarize those, those, all of the sort of different um, uh, sort of extracted trends um, over time as well. So what you're looking at here is just basically a summary um, over per month for each of the individual DBO sites designated by color. Um, and the values of those bars essentially are the overall trends of change. So in other words, the longer the bars, the, the more intense the, the trends. And of course, obviously trends in sea surface temperature, if you're above zero, you're warming, if you're below zero, you're cooling. Um, and the asterisks are denoting which of those are statistically significant. So if you kind of just look, look at things in a very broad brush stroke way, um, you can see how things have changed sea surface temperature wise, um, sea ice wise, chlorophyll, primary productivity. Of course, we um, are limited in terms of the number of months we can look at chlorophyll and primary productivity because they are um, you know, optical data sets that are um, limited by the presence of sea ice and also the occurrence of polar night as well. Um, annual primary productivity can be summarized in terms of overall trends. Um, and then of course, oops, I'm trying to move your um, cameras here so I can see my own slides. Um, uh, annual primary productivity, you can see the overall trends there. DBO3 um, is most significant at 99%. DBO1 also sees some pretty strong changes overall. DBO8 as well, which is up near the Cape Bathurst Polina. Um, breakup formation, annual persistence, we, we see trends sort of across the board, but the overall kind of basic um, takeaway message is that we start to see really um, kind of um, consistent, um, consistently significant trends in these later months, um, sort of September, October, November. Um, and more heterogeneity in those trends in the early, early seasons. Um, just lastly here, I wanted to show some basic um, correlations between um, mean annual primary productivity on the y-axis versus the mean length of open water season on the x-axis, which obviously can be, um, you know, both of which are extracted from, um, from spatial data products as well to really get a sense of, of, of these DBO sites, which perhaps is most significantly driven by um, 
you know, see the presence of sea ice and light as a limited as a limiting factor versus perhaps nutrients. Um, and so you can see just a sense of at the different DBO sites, you see some really different patterns going on. The strongest slopes um, that we find in terms of these relationships seem to occur at DBO3. Um, you can see the example here. And then obviously, if you look at the spatial representation, so basically the slopes of um, these same relationships over here on the left, but shown pixel pixel by pixel rather than um, extracted for the DBO sites as a whole, um, we see similar patterns in terms of really kind of that open water um, being a really important limitation at DBO3, meaning probably there's a lot of nutrient inputs in these areas. And so it's probably less nutrient limited um, and more light limited in terms of sea ice being the most important factor. Um, you can also look at, at um, R squared representation spatially as well to get a sense of, of where the strongest relationships occur. Um, and we see some weak relationships in the Western Bering Strait region. There's some interesting things going on there um, that I won't get into, into today. Um, but really just, again, an example of the types of, of um, analyses um, and sort of post-production that, that can be accomplished using some pretty basic satellite observations along the way. Um, so lastly, I just wanted to not, not necessarily summarize all of that, but just to, to kind of um, plant some seeds in terms of thinking about the, um, the utility of uh, NASA, you know, DBO website along the way and thinking about what might be useful um, for people um, with different skill sets along the way. That first bullet point, uh, availability to download spatial data sets for those wishing to post-process time series using their own methodologies. Um, I think is really important in terms of, of uh, those who, who wish to actually utilize the data themselves. I think the accessibility is really important along the way. Um, those, those scientists that may be less interested in kind of looking at the spatial data themselves and more interested in just the basic extracted statistics of variables within each of the eight DBO sites, I think could be incredibly valuable um, that I don't currently think exists at the moment. Um, and then lastly, it's kind of a, it's kind of a tricky question. Um, there's not a whole lot of spatial primary productivity data sets available for um, public download. There's been a lot of sort of NASA funded PIs along the way that have been funded to develop um, um, sort of those types of products, but they are not currently sort of publicly available. And so I think it's a question in terms of, um, <clears throat> you know, the, the sort of best practices in terms of those types of data sets, because I do think that, um, you know, the, the, the model data sets such as primary productivity can be a little bit trickier because um, there are sort of less standard practices in terms of those types of, of, of data sets that are, um, that are developed along the way. Um, because they're not simply observations, they are sort of a modeled product. There's all sorts of different bells and whistles and sort of, um, you know, different dials that can be tuned. Um, and so there, there are some challenges there along the way that perhaps the community can, can discuss along the way in terms of those data being available um, on such a DBO website as well. So with that, um, I'm going to stop sharing my, my screen. All right. And thank you, uh, Karen. And, and as we, uh, if anybody has a question now or, or want to put it in the chat box, but if you want to say something now, well, as we change out to Maria's talk, this would be appropriate. If not, uh, please put something in the chat box and we can talk about it during the panel discussion at the end of the three speech speeches. <clears throat> I don't see anything in the chat, Karen, so you get to hold on. <laughs> Thanks. There we go. I've got to unmute myself. Um, can you see my slides? Your camera, yeah. Okay. Okay. So um, I just wanted to spend a little bit, um, a brief moment the, um, at the beginning and just talk about a little bit of the background with um, the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network, as well as the um, GeoBond, uh, which is the Group on Earth Observations Biodiversity Observation Network, um, because some of the work that we're doing in the Arctic um, are part of um, some US and global efforts um, to establish um, a marine biodiversity observations from, um, from uh, microbes to whales and from uh, genetics to remote sensing. So this is um, kind of the, the context in which some of this work has been done. 
Okay, let's go ahead and advance. There we go. Um, I'm going to quickly go over this just for a bit of motivation for the MBON or the Marine Biodiversity Observation Network. And um, these two figures kind of epitomize this for, for us and that we know that multiple stressors um, are uh, likely interacting spatially and will affect um, ocean ecosystems. And in the Arctic, this includes things like um, loss of ice, changing sea surface temperature and, and um, changing uh, uh, ocean chemistry. And while we measure biodiversity as a first order indicator, um, our baselines generally are pretty sparse. Um, and importantly, we rarely co-measure um, biodiversity or ecological indicators with the relevant um, environmental change that we talked about previously. And when we do do that, we tend to treat these interactions as static. And when we know that um, there are nonlinear interactions, um, environmental forces are non-stationary, and we also have uh, dynamic geography geographies. So in response to this, um, in about 2014, a Marine Biodiversity Observation Network demonstration project was funded through a National Ocean Partnership Program. And um, then it was recompeted in 2019 and most recently in 20, um, uh, just last year, um, or just this year actually. Um, and a few additional sites were added. Um, and you can see that the sites here on the left um, comprise several different ecosystem types, including um, temperate upwelling regions, regions, uh, um, coral reef, um, as well as um, uh, Arctic ecosystems located in the Chechi. And so um, as part of the MBON, we're uh, measuring uh, biodiversity at multiple scales. We're measuring it um, at multiple levels, including, um, like I said, genetic um, through, um, through habitat diversity. And so as part of that, one of, um, in addition to developing different technology for measuring things in situ, we are trying to um, detect and track um, biogeographic changes um, using advanced remote sensing. Um, and so I just wanted to highlight this, um, this fourth bullet here because that's what we're going to be talking about here in the, um, in the Arctic. So we're doing that primarily through a framework of pelagic seascape ecology. And so pelagic seascape ecology and seascapes are a way that we can relate um, the in organisms or in situ measurements to the um, dynamic marine habitats um, as part of this, um, uh, this MBON. And so what we do is we integrate um, multiple platforms and multiple synoptic uh, data sets um, using machine learning methods. And these include physical variables such as sea surface temperature, salinity, sea ice and sea surface height anomalies, but also biological variables um, um, from ocean color, including chlorophyll A, fluorescence line height, um, and dissolved organic matter. And we do this, um, we classify our data in space and time. And so we get um, a biome or seascape classification that is dynamic. Importantly, it, it, so what you can see um, are the um, classes here in the center figure, where each class um, represents a unique water mass um, or unique water mass characteristics. And you can see that the classes um, and the aerial extent are expanding and contracting in time and move just like the water does. We classify on uh, multiple scales. Um, so let's see. There we go. Um, so um, importantly, so we can um, we are looking at things on both global and a regional scale. And so in this inset here, you can see the Arctic classification um, um, and the different seascapes moving um, throughout the season. Um, we then, at the regional to local scale, we work with um, e ecologists working um, in situ and on the water to um, uh, do ecosystem comparisons and regional um, habitat associations. We're looking at things like bio, um, the in situ biogeochemistry, um, multi-trophic level diversity from phytoplankton to fish, but all, and also looking at fisheries habitat occupancy metrics. Okay, so zooming in at, um, in our um, Arctic ecosystem, this is work um, that is done primarily um, in collaboration with the Arctic Marine Biodiversity Observation Network with Katrin Eichen, SPI, and, um, and Jackie and Lee as part of the, the DBO. And so what I'm showing you here is the seasonal, the mean seasonal seascape extents and, um, and uh, changing in types, seascape types through time. And here um, I'm showing you here on the right are the different variables that go into the seascape classification. So sea surface temperature, salinity, um, dynamic topography, sea surface height, ice, um, and then the ocean color metrics, including a, um, a fluorescence to chlorophyll ratio. 
And what I want to point out to you is that we have several seascapes that regularly show up in the Arctic, and they include um, subpolar and temperate upwelling system, um, seascapes that tend to come up from the Pacific. We tend to see seasonal occurrences of uh, subpolar shelves and um, warmer, and I say warmer, and that's relative, of course, um, warmer uh, blooms that show up in the shelves. We tend to see uh, freshwater um, type seascapes um, that tend to show up particularly in the Beaufort Sea. And then we see a of ice edge blooms um, that seasonally show up. Um, and while they um, comprise a, a small um, spatial area, they tend to be, as, as you know, um, uh, very important uh, for um, the ecology of the region. And then we also have a few um, ice present seascapes um, where we have ice presence um, up to 30% and um, the marginal pack ice where we define that from 30 to 80% and then pack ice, um, um, which could be multi-year or single year ice that is um, um, uh, over 80%. Um, coupling with the DBO, we're um, looking at, um, we're using the, the data that people are collecting um, to both validate, but also um, provide a little bit of ecological meaning to the seascape patterns that we see on, on the surface. And so on the left here, I'm showing you the dominant seascape in July from um, uh, DBO cruises or DBO sites um, from 2013 and 2014. And um, in the middle area here, what I'm showing you are um, benthic temperature and salinity in an, in an attempt to uh, look at different uh, physical water masses. And what we can see um, based on the different colors here um, is that the different seascapes actually represent different, of course, as we, as we would expect, different um, physical, uh, physical conditions um, in, in, in the water. But importantly, these are um, hold true down um, to the benthos as well. But what's um, interesting for the MBON is that these uh, seascapes are actually describing differences in integrated um, chlorophyll A and sediment chlorophyll A, as we, as we may expect, because, I mean, certainly surface chlorophyll A goes into the classification. But we're also starting to see and look at more closely patterns of in-faunal biomass and in-faunal um, diversity. And these are, um, these are again, these are um, data courtesy of, of Jackie and Lee as part of the DBO. So these are these are ongoing um, comparisons, and um, and hopefully the next time I come up and give a a, a, a presentation, we'll see more. But I just wanted to um, show you a little bit about what I mean, how seascapes can vary through time. And now I'm not showing you um, the annual climatology, but here I'm showing you month by month um, changes. And we can extract um, from these seascape max maps, we can extract different regions of interest and look at the dominance of different seascapes um, based on their extent through time. So up here um, on the top uh, figure here on the time series, we're showing you the uh, the extent of the seascapes coverage um, in the north. And here um, I'm showing you in the south. And these correspond roughly to uh, DBO4 and DBO3 in terms of, um, it's a little uh, further in space in terms of uh, what they cover. But what you can see are um, strong seasonal and um, both seasonal and interannual differences, of course, as we have the, um, the uh, grow up and, and um, um, uh, and um, melt of, of sea ice and um, the influx of different um, water mass types as, as they're coming in. Certainly, you can see in, um, the interannual oscillations of some of these more temperate waters um, coming in, particularly in the southern, um, southern region here. And we can do something similar, of course, when we extract the DBO. And we can see, again, we can see differences in the interannual variability of um, some of these more temperate uh, regions where there's um, periods, there's oscillatory periods um, and general trends as well. And I also just want to point out some of the general trends here as the sea ice recedes a little, um, um, stays, um, or the open water season um, uh, uh, stays later and later. We're starting to see um, periods periods where we actually just um when we include ocean color in our assessments, we're actually seeing periods um, in um, DBO4 and DBO5 where there's um just areas that are pretty invisible to our remote sensing. So um we can 
uh, take these seascape um, habitat indices and we can look at a changes in seascape exposure and we can compare them to north and south. And exposure is one way that we're um, using and as part of our MBOD studies as a way to maybe minimize um, some of the effects of phenology, but also look, um, compare data that um, may um, vary um, it, it seasonally to um, in situ data sets that may integrate longer time, um, time um, time and spatial scales. So this exposure again is this product of duration and spatial extent. Um, and um, what we can see is that, um, of course, we see the declines in this uh, pack ice in both the north and the south. And then if we combine all of these ice edge bloom um, 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 uh, seascapes, and these uh, um, these include polynias. Um, what we can see is that uh, at both in the north and in the south, we we are starting to see um, some increases in the um, the exposure of of um, these systems to um, to ice edge blooms. And again, these are these kind of high high produ highly productive um, ice edge blooms. Um, but but we're seeing this increase um, primarily, um, at least in with this metric. In, in our more northerly um, seascapes, or sorry, more nor northerly regions. And again, ultimately, um, our goal is here is to review, uh, to look at the role of these kinds of habitat types um, and extent and exposure on the in situ assemblages. And we can do this, um, we can, and we're looking at these not just in ice edge blooms, but we can look at the effects of shelf ecosystems and as well as freshwater um, influenced uh, seascapes um, on in situ assemblages. Um, one thing I want to point out that Karen um, pointed out um, already is that um, uh, we have challenges um, whenever we're using ocean color or passive measurement, um, passive satellite measurements with seeing um, the system, particularly in the fall. And right here, I'm showing you um, the ice minima with differences in, um, in year uh, for our Pacific region. And you can see the ice minimum as it's going towards um, um, the later regions, the ice minimum is, is um, it's for further and further north. Um, and then we can see when we actually have ocean color observations. And <clears throat> while it's pretty noisy in the beginning of the spring, it's pretty obvious um, in the fall that we have this whole um, period of time where we have open water, but we can't, we don't have the satellite um, capacity to see that with passive ocean color measurements. And that, um, and the other important thing is that that um, time frame is actually increasing in both the north and the south, at least from about 2006 to present. Um, I, I will just point out that we're working right now on getting, um, we have seascapes right now in, in NOAA Coast Watch, and we're working on getting them in the, um, our, uh, the AU's um, um, Ocean da Data Explorer. And I'll just summarize um, a couple of things. I think some of these are repetitive to what Karen mentioned, but um, in terms of the seascapes themselves, the habitat index um, provides a means of in integrating um, multiple plat platforms of in situ data and um, provide oceanographic context to some of our ecological time series. Um, our in seascape in situ relationships are ongoing, and we're looking at multiple trophic levels, um, biogeochemistry, but also um, benthic um, uh, relationships. There's an issue of shoulder season um, invisibility, and so I hope that we can discuss a little bit about the use of models as well as um, active sensors in the DBO um, uh, NASA repertoire, um, perhaps thinking about as uh, more light, LIDAR based products come on board. Um, and then um, just repeating what Karen say, said. Um, thinking about the use of um, archived synoptic data, thinking also about regionally specific algorithms and, and DBO specific time series of some of these satellite data products. And that's it. Thank you, Maria. That's a great talk. Um, if anybody has a question, I've already got one for Karen. You can just put it in the uh, Dropbox unless somebody, I see their hands. I don't see anybody now. So just pop it in the Dropbox. And we'll have our third speaker, which is Lynette, and I'm going to try this, Lynette Bosede. <laughs> and she's going to, she's from NASA, and we'll talk about the DBO website and updates. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jackie. So uh, it's it's pronounced Bois there, but it's oh. French. Don't worry, no one can pronounce it. <laughs> Sorry. 
Yeah, no worries. So yeah, um, this is just a short little presentation talking about the NASA DBO website, some updates, and our need for community inputs um, and suggestions for what we can do to update the website even more than we have. Um, yeah, so um, the website was originally created by Joey Camiso and Larry Stock, and uh, Larry is still producing a bunch of the figures and data for the website. Um, uh, just last Wednesday, um, myself and Jeremy took over kind of the updating of the website. So we've done some things, but we're not there yet. So I'm just going to walk you through those and show you everything. All right, so next slide. So yeah, this is just a screenshot from the website. Um, there's a link. And then if you're lazy, you can just scan that um, QR code with your phone and it'll bring you right to the link. So that's like the new thing with COVID. So yeah, so just an example. <laughs> Sorry, next slide. <sighs> yeah, so um, it was already discussed what the DBO is, but essentially um, it's a multi-US agency collaboration to study changes in this biological activity in the Arctic Ocean. Um, mainly um, off the coast of Alaska and the Chukchi, Barents, and Bering Strait. Um, and the DBO, there's eight sites that are outlined in red, as in the figure. And these regions were chosen because they have high productivity, biodiversity, and um, large changes in um, biological activity due to sea ice loss in both coverage and sea ice thickness. Um, it's important to note that these areas are also um, dominated mostly by first year sea ice, which is um, sea ice that doesn't survive the summer melt, and it tends to be thinner than multi-year ice. And also to note that uh, first year sea ice is becoming the more predominant uh, sea ice cover in the Arctic Ocean with sea ice loss. All right, so next slide. So, so far on the website, um, we have weekly and daily maps of different satellite data products that are bilinearly, bilinearly interpolated, I can never say that right, interpolated onto a 12.5 polar kilometer polar stereographic grid, which this, um, an example of this is shown on the on the right. And on each of these figures, the DBO sites are outlined in the black boxes. So just so you know where they are. Um, so these, these maps are produced from different uh, data sets. So we have um, passive microwave uh, SSMI. We have um, the MODIS instrument. We also use SMAP, um, a JSON, um, an ocean surface topography mission product and also some reanalysis data from uh, NSEP. All right, next slide. So on the website itself, that should just start playing, I think, yeah. Um, we have some animations of daily sea ice concentrations and 10, me 10 meter six hour winds. We also have animations of weekly chlorophyll concentrations from Aquamotus and daily uh, NOAA sea surface temperatures. Um, we have just static weekly average maps of chlorophyll pigment concentration from MODIS, sea surface temperatures from MODIS, and sea ice concentration from SSMI. And we also have this for cloud fraction from MODIS as well. And then we also finally we have some daily or multi-day averaged data sets or maps depending on the product. Um, and these are the daily winds and sea level pressure from NSEP, eight day sea surface salinity from SMAP, and a 21 day product of sea surface height anomalies from JSON-3. So next slide. And then, so we've also have, um, average and anomaly time series at each of the DBO sites for some of the products. Um, these include the NOAA sea surface temperature, uh, MODIS chlorophyll, and sea surface temperatures and cloud fraction. Um, we also have this for ice concentration, and we also have um, this for NSEP sea level pressure and 10 meter wind speeds, SMAP sea surface salinity, and JSON uh, three sea surface height anomalies. And um, 
Most of them start in 2002 with the, with the Aqua satellite, except for um, the SMAP and JSON, they were launched at later years. And we, I would ideally like to have these updated um, weekly on the website, these time series. So next slide. So yeah, so now for some improvements to the website. Um, so for the, the static maps of the of weekly average chlorophyll, sea surface temperatures, ice concentrations, cloud fractions, sea level pressure, um, salinity, and sea surface height anomalies, we've added a little description describing some of these figures and also the time series uh, for the DBO sites, just to give some background and um, knowledge. And we plan on updating these uh, bi-weekly, these descriptions. So next slide. Um, we've also, for these same, uh, these same data products, we've also added tables like this one. I just pulled this from the website, um, which highlights some um, statistical information at each of the DBO sites. So this one is just showing uh, the MODIS um, sea surface temperature at each of the DBO sites. And we have things like the average over the time period, the trend per decade, um, the minimum uh, sea surface temperature and what year it occurred in and the maximum and what year that occurred in. The weekly average sea surface temperature for the most recent um, week that we have available. And then um, the ranking of it on over the record. So we were doing that for each of the data props. And we also have put these historical data files and their metadata on the website that are used to make these tables. So you can pull that raw data and play around with it as well for the DBO sites. Okay, next slide. And then um, for one of the data products, we added um, MODIS SST um, weekly average maps for uh, all of 2022, this current year so far. And we could probably add more if needed. I just wanted to show that we could also add this as well. And there are also GIFs. These aren't playing, but they are GIFs if you download them. So you can see the changes over time. Next slide. So the future updates. So we, we are working with Larry um, to get all the, the daily data files that are used to produce all these figures um, and data sets and put them on the website for at least three months, depending on their size, because um, we can only store a certain amount on our NASA website here. Um, but um, we plan to, and, we, and we'd also like to in, put up more weekly figures, historical weekly figures for all the data for so people to click on. Um, we also want to format these data files into a uniform uh, data format, such as like GeoTIFF or something else. And, we're really looking to get community input on that for what you guys would like to see. Um, and then we want to update the, the data for the DBO sites and the time series at a more real time pace, and then possibly add in um, uh, MODIS Terra data from the Terra satellite. All right, next slide. So yeah, I, I basically we wanted to get some of your in, input. Um, we wanted to know what data formats do you like best with working with the data? Um, what other data sets you'd like to see? Some that I think of is um, perhaps uh, series radiation terms like long wave, short wave radiation. Um, we also produce a uh, yearly melt and freeze onset product that could also be put up on the site. Um, potentially some airs data from the atmospheric infrared sounder, which is also on aqua and we could do things like skin temperature or total precipitable water. And um, another product that might be useful is um, the ISAT2 sea ice quick look product that just came out recently, um, but it has sea ice thickness that could be used and that could be beneficial for um, under ice blooms of the sea ice as the sea ice is becoming thinner and more light is penetrating through them. So things like that were just some other ideas. Um, but yeah, we really wanted to get feedback on what you guys want to see. Um, so you can either do that, do that now or take a look at the website on your leisure and shoot me an email and try to work with that. And yeah, if any of you, anyone wants to collaborate with us on projects using the data and this kind of research, please feel free to reach out as well. 
And that's it. Great, great Lynette, and I like your <laughs> co-author there, Mr. Cat. So <laughs> yeah, I know. Sorry, I don't know. If he's no, he no, knows it's fine. Right. Mine's, mine's in the other room, so it, it's great. <laughs> People are saying they love the cat. So yeah. I want to thank you uh, very much. If anybody has a, a question for Lynette, and actually if, uh, there are questions coming in in the in the chat box now. And so I think I'll open up a panel, uh, the three of you uh, that take any questions and maybe we can start uh, with, uh, besides the cat issue is a uh, question was, you, and you answered it part about Karen about getting the uh, nutrient data and the nitrate data. And maybe just briefly, uh, people can see all the details in the chat. But I noticed Cal Morty also put in a connection where they're actually looking for some of this from space. I was wondering if you could just say a lot, statement or two. about the nutrients. I can't hear you, Karen. Can you hear me? <laughs> are you asking Are you asking me? Well, I'm just asking you to briefly, because it's a whole chat. If Because uh, you were saying- oh, I, I just answered, Bob. Bob was asking about sort of the, the source of where I was showing the nitrate climatologies. Um, and it's not satellite-based. Um, Calvin may know more about sort of the, the satellite-based um, um, attempts at sort of get, getting nutrient um, which may have more to do with, with having a sense of sea surface temperature and, and um, the presence of chlorophyll and kind of extracting nitrates maybe based on those relationships. But um, Calvin, do you wanna say more about that particular? Well, so, so that works well in some regions and mm -hmm. not well in some upwelling regions. So, and I haven't looked at the, how that works up in the Chukchi, but mm -hmm. on the West coast of the US, it doesn't, uh, there's upwelling and it doesn't really capture all of that. So. Um, I don't know how, how applicable it is to, to our region of interest. Yeah. But it, also though, it may, you have the, the summer water at the surface and then you have this higher nutrients in the, in the deeper water um, and a lot of subsurface chlorophyll blooms. Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm wondering, does, how well does, is that captured in, in the remote sensing? And then also I made a mention of how the productivity is so high in the West, it's soup on the Western side, but there's no trend in productivity. Maybe it's already maxed out uh, on DBO3. I just saw there was a little spatial gradient across DBO3. Yeah, DBO3 is really interesting actually, because it's, it extends across um, as, as um, Maria can certainly attest to in, in terms of her, her, um, her interests and in study across the region as well is that there's um, lots of different um, sort of dynamic activity going on there. And what's interesting about DBO3 is that um, on the Eastern side of things, we actually are, um, you know, during some months seeing increases, but the overall annual increases are being dampened by the fact that you actually have decreases in the West and particular in the Western Bering Strait, particularly in, in June. Um, and you're, you're kind of averaging things out to a, to a certain degree. Um, so it's kind of a wash in terms of overall productivity. But if you kind of zoom in and look at sort of pixel by pixel, there's some really interesting heterogeneity in terms of trends going on there. Um, so yeah, the Western Bering Strait is kind of doing its own thing. And then sort of east, east from there is sort of doing, um, you know, having its, its own, um, own patterns as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, in, in terms of the, the ocean color data, I mean, others can speak to this as well, but um, it's really difficult, I think, to, uh, I think there are a lot of, of people trying to sort of investigate where in the water column you're actually extracting your, your overall chlorophyll concentrations from. Um, these waters are incredibly complex, optically complex. Um, and if the blooms at the surface, right, you're sort of looking at a, a, a relatively shallow, um, area of the water column, but if the blooms are deeper and the, the water column is less turbid, for instance, then you're looking at sort of a, 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 a deeper optical depth. Um, so, you know, there have been people trying to quantify, um, you know, exactly where in the water column we're, we're looking, but um, it's, a, it's a difficult task for sure. Yeah, and, and Maria, you were, if you put, uh, there's a statement that came out here, uh, do you, the seascapes that you're seeing, are they average, they're, are they temporal or are they, Averaged over the year that you showed the different kind of groupings. 
Oh, so a seascape patch can actually move throughout um, throughout the year. So, and they they may not be in the same place or have the same extent from from year to year. So, a May two thousand three seascape may look um, you know may look very different than a you know May May twenty seventeen, of course. And and yeah, so what that kind of does is um, it allows us to see um, kind of. Uh, physical conditions as well as the response envelopes of the phytoplankton to those physics and the spatial footprint of that. And so um, one thing that I'm, I'm very curious um, to look at is, I mean, uh, you know, thinking about what, what Karen um, showed, it's, it's that as we start to see um, you know, more blooms or more productivity happening in the, the later season, are these occurring with different, A, different water masses and, and or B, are they um, a response of uh, communities that have different composition than we would necessarily expect from a, a, an earlier um, spring or ice retreat bloom? The other question I, I have, and I noticed this chat box, people are asking questions and, and responding in real time, which is great to Lynette and, and to, about some of the product, but to both of you, uh, to, to Karen, is, is the phytoplankton size species composition, because that was one of the questions here, is that how that is, uh, how that can be captured or hasn't been captured. Uh, they were saying, I think it'd be interesting to consider the composition of these blooms as they occur at different times. And is that something that can be pulled out of satellites? We, we collect things in the field, and I know you all are collecting some of these real time uh, if you have any comments about that, either one of you. Sorry, is that for me, Jackie? Yeah, I, I got a little distracted today, trying to re respond I, to the chat. <laughs> I think because you are, yeah, I know you are because you have the machine and you're looking at the species. And then I know yes. Karen and Louisa was there. In yeah, last exactly. And and that's a, that is um, particularly with pace um, coming on, and perhaps even um, and art of colors might, might be a component of that as well. But the um, capacity um, to derive species composition or plankton community composition, whether it be um, changes in size distribution or dominant functional types, that's that's growing. And um, and I do think um, one of the um, Th things that we can start to look at is, is you know, um, size composition, I think, is one of um, a relatively straightforward thing to measure um, with, you know, just it, and historically, we've done this with fractionated chlorophyll even. Um, and um, there are um, like uh, Jeremy Wardell has an, um, a generalized um, uh, uh, inherent optical properties suite in which they're looking at the spectral slope of backscattering and that um, is related um, theoretically to the size fraction and so I, I do think that there's um, ways that we can um, we can start using these data right now of course the optical complexity is going in the in these waters is always going to be an issue and it's it's an issue worldwide in, in coastal waters um, in terms of how well um, the suite of existing algorithms for plankton community co composition work um, so but yeah I think it's I think it's an area that um, uh, is, is expanding okay great anything you want to add to that Karen because I know that uh, like even on the work that I know Claire's got with the, the phytoplankton the age of the phytoplankton right and and the, the degradation is being able to look using some satellites that's her new paper out right yeah, so I have a PhD student. Um, she's looking at proportions of chlorophyll and phaophyton based on field measurements to basically give a sense of the age of the bloom. Um, so in other words, the, the, um, the longer it's been since the initial bloom, the, the greater the phaophyton you're actually going to have in the, in the system. And then she's comparing, since we only have field observations in one place at one time in order to incorporate sort of a time series component of things. She's um, comparing things against um, satellite data to kind of um, confirm that indeed it was an old bloom or a new bloom um, to kind of just validate the utilization of, of that field metric. Okay, thanks. And Lynette, I know that the, I think we will, we will pull people who are on, on here to to give them your, her email is there on the agenda for this for this uh, uh, presentation and to send her comments, she, the request that she has her, this whole uh, presentation and webinar is uh, recorded. 
So maybe we'll be pinging the group too to get some responses directly to you on that. Because I think the whole idea, part of the initiative of this was to be able to give feedback to NASA and, and vice versa on things that can be done and things that would be more useful to produce products for the for the DVO community. So um, that, yeah, that, that's great. And, and there's a lot of nice stuff coming out in the chat. Uh, there's one here about the some carbon-based productivity model. It's, it's, uh, I guess it's uh, actually to that could be used to be useful for products also. Um, oh, there are more questions. So, so, yep. And then there's listing uh, of where uh, other types of um, product uh, research being done. Uh, and I would point out that Sue Moore put in there that the, the, if any comments were re, uh, related to the seascapes and uh, looking at the communities of using acoustics of for marine mammals or observations of seabirds to put that habitat to, and I think you are doing some of that to the, the habitat relationship, right? Yeah, 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 we are doing some of that. We're um, we're doing that with Kathy and with um, Kate as part of um, the Ambon. One of the issues we were running into a little bit with some of the seabird work was that um, some of our satellite data and in particularly the um, sea ice um, data that we're using is a little bit uh, coarse to uh, be able to see some of the finer scale spatial variability, particularly when we're looking at an ice edge. And um, so that's, that's where something, um, 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 I mean, we're 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 tr we're working on that, and um, but that's where some some of the um, the time series and synoptic time series that we may be able to get from the DBO NASA um, cooperative um, might be really really helpful. If, if particularly if those um, those standardized um, interpolated data sets were available historically. Okay, great. Um, are there any other comments? Uh, I think that we're gonna. There we go. So the four emails in there. But I, I think for most of the questions, unless you have some final statements you want, we have like five minutes left that I just wanted to open it up to anybody who wanted to make any announcements. Uh, but first of all, I want to say thank you to all three of you, Lynette, uh, Maria, and, and Karen, for your presentations. They're going to be on the website as is the recording. And I think people will be sending you questions separately too. But uh, thank you very much for your time. I just wanted to note that Harmony Weiner is our, our early career co-lead on the Marine Ecosystem Collaborative team. I think she's on the, somewhere on our screen here. And I think at this point, I would just open it up if there are any community updates that you want to bring forward uh, at, at this time. And then, then I'm going to head this back to, to Meredith. Oh, Cal, by the way, Cal says uh, aircraft surveys, uh, would they be useful with uh, hyperspectral imagery? in the fall uh, for providing data sets. So anyway, that's something. Um, but here's the name of uh, people's emails. You can get a hold of them. Uh, so I'll just cover my mouth. Does anybody want to say anything or raise your hand that you want to make an announcement? Otherwise, I think we're coming on the end. I don't see anything. So I want to thank you all for that. I think this questions that are show the shoulder season part of it is really becoming more and more uh, important. And we're seeing that in our field uh, cruises going out in October and November. And so, um, you know, I guess that's something we, I, I know that a lot of the products aren't coming out uh, at that time of the year. So at that point, um, I would say thank you very much for your time and I'll send it back to you, Meredith, for any final conclusion. Yep. Thanks everyone. This meeting will be, was recorded. Uh, will be posted along with the chat um, for the most part uh, on the IARPIC website. So you can send it along to anyone you think would uh, be interested. All right. And so I think that, uh, yeah, so nice, nice thank you notes for the presentation. Well done on the webinar. Thanks, Meredith, for your help. And I hope you all have a good evening and afternoon and enjoy your cat, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> all right. Bye bye. Thanks, Jackie. Bye. Ha, ha, ha.